There we go, record. All right. So we're gonna do a little bit more practice with Lewis dot structures, and then we're gonna start talking about geometry. Um, and I'm not gonna make you do proofs if your geometry class is into ice. You guys have integrated math instead now, right? Instead of, we used to be, you took algebra one, then you took geometry, and then you took algebra two. Um, now everything's sort of integrated. So, but what I remember doing, taking geometry, was a lot of proofs. Prove that this, these two triangles are congruent or, yeah. We're not going to be doing any of those for this class. Um, but we are going to talk about shapes in three dimensions and how these different geometries work. Um, let's start by looking at uh, some Lewis dot structures. We've got chlorate and nitric acid. Let's start by trying to do the formal or the um, Lewis dot structures that you think are the best in terms of their formal charge. Nitric acid might be easier. Yeah. So for the nitric acid, we get one electron for a being for the hydrogen plus five electrons for the nitric or for the nitrogen plus three times six electrons for the oxygen. This is a total of 24, right? Which we did this, we did the Lewis dot structure for nitrate the other day as one of our examples for practicing formal charge, right? On Monday. What did we put in the middle? Do we ever put a hydrogen in the middle? No. And sh should we put oxygen in the middle in this case? No. 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 So we'll, we're start, going to start by just using process of elimination and say nitrogen is going to be in the middle. When it was just nitrate, we started by putting the oxygens around. What do we do with the hydrogen? All the ones we've done so far, we would do something like that, right? Yeah. So let's see if that works. You can tell by the way I'm setting you up there that probably this isn't going to work, but let's try it and see what happens. So then what do we do? We've got 24 electrons. How do we start filling? Do the bonds. We just used eight electrons, so we're down to 16 left. How many does each oxygen still need? Six, and there's three of them. So that's a total of how many electrons do we need to still add to the oxygens? All right, sorry, total. Six times three, 18. All right, do we have 18 electrons? No, not left. We only have 16 left. We can start. Let's let's start satisfying. We just used 12 of our 16. We only have four left. Is that going to work? We we used up all of our electrons. <clears throat> And the oxygen doesn't have a full valence, right? Can we do anything about that? What would we normally do? We use up all of our electrons and we would do a double bond. Can we do that here? No, how do we make a double bond? By erasing a lone pair and moving it towards the middle, right? That's not gonna help us in this case. So something else must be going on. Does anybody else, or does anybody remember what the structure looked like when it was just nitrate? It didn't have what? It didn't have the hydrogen. So we didn't do this, right? We did that instead. 
right? Because we had the same number of electrons to work with. This filled all the all of our valences, met all of our criteria, right? But now where are we going to put the hydrogen? We have a hydrogen with no electrons. We connect it to one of the oxygens. Take one of those oxygen lone pairs that's sitting around and turn it into a bond to the hydrogen. Right, so I use this one as an example that sometimes there can be more than one central atom. We could consider the nitrogen the central atom, or we could consider this oxygen to be a central atom, right? We don't have to have everything directly connected here. In fact, if we try to do that, sometimes it just it won't, won't work. And so sometimes recognizing the pieces, recognizing that nitric acid is a nitrate with an H plus added. Well, if you're going to take an H plus and add it to nitrate, what part of nitrate would, would a hydrogen, would an H plus be most attracted to? What's the charge on this nitrogen? It has eight electrons around it, but remember formal charge, these bonds only count for half, right? So it's actually a plus one because it owns, quote unquote, owns four electrons, but it has five on the periodic table. What's the formal charge on this oxygen? Eight. Well, sorry, it has um, eight electrons around it. Four of those eight electrons, though, are shared. So it owns two here, plus these four that it owns outright. So it has six electrons, right? How many electrons does it have on the periodic table? Sorry, valence electrons. I keep saying electrons. I mean valence electrons. Just six, right? So if it still owns six electrons and it has six valence electrons there, it's got a charge of zero. <clears throat> what about these two oxygens? They're identical to each other, so we can make them, they're going to be the same. How many electrons do they own? Six outright plus a bond. So that gives it a total of eight valence electrons, but it only owns seven of them because it doesn't really control these ones in the bond all the time. They're shared, remember? So if it's got seven electrons, on um, periodic table, oxygen has six valence electrons. What's the charge? Or minus one. Minus one. It gained an electron, which makes it minus one. So out of this molecule, where do you suppose would be the best place to add a hydrogen? On one of the two oxygens that has a negative one charge. Because H plus has a positive charge. Right? So this is an example of if you can recognize that your acid is really just a polyatomic ion with an H plus stuck to it. You can start by doing the Lewis dot structure just for nitrate and then see where there's a negative charge and just stick the, the hydrogen on one of the negative charges. And so on either of these two oxygens, we wouldn't put it on this oxygen because this oxygen's already got two bonds, right? This oxygen's already stable and has a formal charge of zero. We wouldn't put it on the nitrogen because the nitrogen has a plus one charge. It already has eight electrons around it. It's already stable. These two both have negative one charges. Therefore, that would be a good spot to put an H plus, a hydrogen. All right. Let's do another polyatomic ion. That's, I guess, let's, before we do chlorate, let's do sulfate. What's the formula for sulfate? 
That's sulfite. SO4 with a two minus charge, right? So how many electrons do we have to work with? Six valence electrons from the sulfur plus four oxygens that, that each have six valence electrons plus a negative two charge. What's the negative two charge going to do? Gives us two extra electrons because electrons are negative. Damn you, Ben Franklin. So what do we get for our total here then? 32 electrons. For sulfate, what are we going to put in the middle? Which one's more electronegative? Sulfur or oxygen? Oxygen, the one that's closest to fluorine. Sulfur is still close to fluorine, but it's two hops away from fluorine. Oxygen directly adjacent to fluorine. It's diagonal, but it's not, not as close, right? It's sharing a whole side. So we'll put sulfur in the middle, surround it with oxygens. Now what do we do? Start doing the bonds, right? How many did we just use? Eight. We just used eight, so now we're down to 24 electrons left. How many does each oxygen still need? Needs another six on each of the oxygens, right? Yeah. Six times four is? So that evenly divides up our remaining electrons. Mm -hmm. All right, so what are our criteria for if we did a good job on a Lewis dot structure? What's the first rule? All the electrons. Use the right number of electrons. Did we use all 32 of our electrons? Yeah. And no more. We don't get to just throw extra electrons in either. So we're good there. Number of electrons. What was our second criteria? Fill all the valences. Do we meet that criteria? Yes. Yeah. What's our last criteria? Formal charge. formal charge. And what's what do we want for most to be most stable for the formal charge? Yeah. On each of the atoms, we want their formal charge to be as close to zero as possible. If this whole molecule has a negative two charge to it, we're gonna have an, some negatives in here at least, right? But as long as they are as close to zero as we can get them, then that's still a stable Lewis dot structure. What are the, what's the formal charge on each oxygen here? They're all the same. They own seven electrons. We already did oxygen with a single bond, right? So they're all, Minus one. What's the what's the formal charge on the sulfur? It owns four. And how many does it have on the periodic table? Six. So it lost two electrons. So plus two. Does that add up to our overall charge on the molecule? Yeah, sulfate was a minus two charge, right? Okay. Is there a way we could do this better? Could we get this plus two to be closer to zero? Maybe. I'm asking the question, so that kind of makes you think about it. If all we thought about was the octet rule, we'd be done. Meaning the first two criteria is all you need for it to be a valid Lewis dot structure. 
Is it the best Lewis dot structure? No. Turns out not. Because what does sulfur have? What do elements on the third row of the periodic table have that elements in the second row don't? They're in the third energy level. And when you go from the second energy level to the third energy level, what do you add? More electrons. And where do you put them? In the higher energy level? How about a d orbital? You added a d orbital when we went from n equals 2 to n equals 3, right? Does sulfur have any electrons in a d orbital? No, but it's there. It's there, it's just empty. Elements in the third row of the periodic table or lower can go past eight electrons if it lowers their formal charge, to get their formal charge closer to zero. So basically that whole rule for filling all the valences, they need to have at least eight electrons. But when you get to the third row of the periodic table, you can have more than eight electrons. So if we have a plus two here and we wanted to get that closer to zero, what could we do? We could add, we, well, we can't just add two electrons. We can't just do that because then we didn't, we violated the first rule, right? But we could do bonds. And how do we do that? The same way, if we if we wanted to give more electrons to the central atom, but we ran out of electrons before, we made double bonds, right? Yeah. Is there anything stopping us from doing that? Now, what's the formal charge on the sulfur? Uh, plus one. Plus one, yeah. Uh, we're not quite there yet. We're we're headed there though. Uh, what did we just do to the formal charge on this oxygen? The formal charge was a minus one, and now it's zero. So remember, we oh, didn't share, take share. it away, they're shared. Formal charge is closer to zero means more stable, right? So we made the oxygen more stable and the sulfur more stable. So now we just do the same thing on one of the other oxygens. Pick one, doesn't matter which one. Now we've got our sulfur has a formal charge of zero. And we've got two of our four oxygens have a formal charge of zero. This is more stable. This is a better Lewis dot structure. The way we started was OK, but this is better. So, Aria. Yeah. So I do partial credit. So what if you got to that, if you met the first two criteria, but you forgot the third, then that's probably a three out of four. You got most of the way there. It's not the best Lewis dot structure, but it's a Lewis dot structure. So remind, remembering what we did with the nitric acid, what do you suppose the uh, Lewis dot structure looks like for sulfuric acid. What's the formula for, for sulfuric acid? SO4 with enough H pluses to make it neutral, right? So we'd add it to the two that still have a negative charge. Landon? So it has more than eight electrons. But because the third row of the periodic, the third energy level is where d orbitals start showing up, it can go past the eight electrons. And so there's some elements, there's some compounds where that's an advantage because that allows you to get your formal charges closer to zero. But that you will only ever see that from the third row of the periodic table or lower. Second row of the periodic table, the octet rule is a hard rule. Second row of the periodic table, you want eight electrons, no more. You can't go past it. But as soon as you get to the third row of the periodic table, you can. You need at least eight electrons once you get to the third row of the periodic table. All right.
So if our formula for sulfuric acid is sulfate with two extra H pluses, where are they going to go? Where would we add our H pluses? The oxygens that still have a minus one charge, right? If we take one of these lone pairs and turn it into a bond, Now, all of a sudden, everything has a formal charge of zero. Everything's stable. It would be a Lewis dot structure if I drew it. Like that. That's still a Lewis dot structure. But then this still has a minus one. What's the formal charge on this oxygen? This oxygen has three bonds and one lone pair. So how many electrons does it own? One, two, three, plus a pair that it owns outright. So five. And on the periodic table, oxygen has six <laughs> valence electrons. So again, this meets the first two criteria, but the better option is put one of the hydrogens on each of the oxygens, because then everything gets a formal charge of zero. All right. One more for extra practice. Let's do chlorate. ClO3 with a minus one charge. Count your electrons. Figure out what goes in the middle. Get those formal charges close to zero. We have weather coming in. All right, I give you enough of a head start. How many electrons do we have to work with with chlorate? 34, sounds about right. Seven from the chlorine plus three oxygens that each have six valence electrons plus one electron for the charge. So that gives us a total of eight, sorry, eight plus 18, 28. Maybe did perchlorate, 20, 26. Yes, I can do, I can do that. You'd never know it, but I had a math minor in undergrad, but we don't do any arithmetic when we start taking upper division math classes. And that's a skill that goes away very quickly. All right, out of our 26 valence electrons, what do we start with? Start with the bonds, and then we just use the six, right? So we have 20 electrons left. Where are we going to put them? Put them around. Filling up the oxygens is going to use up 18, right? Where are those last ones going to go? So we just used all of our electrons. We filled all the valences. This is a pretty good Lewis dot structure. Could it be better? And how? We want to get rid of the top ones? So where would we put them? So if we did this, now all of a sudden this oxygen's got 10 electrons around it. We can't do that. So we can make um, more 
bonds, you can make double bonds, but they've got to come from one of the oxygens. So as it is, as it sits here, we've got three oxygens that are all minus one. What's the formal charge on the chlorine right now? It owns five electrons. One, two, three, plus the pair that it owns outright. And it's got seven on the periodic table, right? So it's a plus two. And all of the oxygens are, are minus one. So we can do better. Because chlorine, is that a probability reference? Uh, probably. Probably, might as well be. Might as well. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. No. None of you have small Andrew. children at home that have gone through the Bob Builder phase. Wow. Maybe oh, so that's, that's what it was. That's what it was. <laughs> All right. If we take a pair of electrons from an oxygen at random, turn them into a double bond. It's not plus two anymore. Now our chlorine is plus one. So that made it that made two of our atoms more stable. Let's do it again. Pick another oxygen at random. Erase a, pair, a lone pair. Turn it into an extra bond. Now our chlorine has a formal charge of zero. And so do both of these oxygens. All right, if you're not sure that the chlorine has a formal charge of zero, count how many electrons it owns. It's got a lot more than eight valence electrons around it now, but it owns one, two, three, four, five, plus a lone pair, so seven total. And it's in column 18, so it had, or column 17. So well, on the periodic table, it had seven electrons. Everything's stable this way. And we just get one extra oxygen with a negative charge we can't do anything about. And something has to have a negative charge out of these because the whole molecule has a negative charge. There is, I guess, one equally valid Lewis out structure. Yes, helium and hydrogen are the first row. So I know I've made a big deal of it. It's from the third row and lower. Remember that the third row is the one that starts with sodium. So chlorine is in the third row of the periodic table. Hydrogen and helium is the first row. <coughs> so here we have an oxygen with a negative one charge and everything else neutral. Is there another Lewis dot structure where everything is just as close to zero. Do it one more. Now all of our oxygens are zero. And the chlorine is a minus one. We've got to put, have a negative one on something. Either of those are valid. Technically, if you have to choose where you're putting a negative one charge, you want to put it on the most electronegative element. Because if something has to have a negative one charge, it might as well be the element that's best at holding on to its electrons. So this is slightly better as a Lewis dot structure, but both of them would be full credit answers. This one's also slightly better because if we had to add a hydrogen, where would we expect it to be? Make it an acid on the oxygen. So along with noting that there are some, some patterns in the naming for the polyatomic ions and their formulas, there's patterns in how they behave as well. Those polyatomic ions where you've got those oxygens and negative charges, when you make them an acid, Basically, all you're going to be doing is throwing a hydrogen atom or a hydrogen ion onto an oxygen. Connor? So, uh, a hydrogen atom has one down for it. A hydrogen atom does, not a hydrogen ion. So, the ion doesn't have any? 
So hydrogen ion doesn't have any electrons. So all we're adding is, is an H plus. It's basically just a nucleus floating around with no electrons. And it just gloms onto something with a lone pair or something with a negative charge. We'll spend more time with acids when we get to talking about equilibrium and uh, pH after the midterm. All right. So why are we spending so much time with Lewis dot structures? They're, they're an abstraction. I told you formal charge is not a real thing. Um, it's just a way for us to estimate which of these Lewis dot structures is better. So why do we care so much about these? Because if we know what the Lewis dot structures look like, if we know roughly where to find the electrons around these atoms, it tells us something about the shape of the molecule itself. And so here's a few key points. Almost all of the volume around an atom is electrons, are those electron clouds, right? Remember the baseball at, at uh, the pitcher's mound analogy, the baseball is the size of the nucleus, the rest of the stadium is the, the electrons. Those electrons are all negatively charged and similar charges repel each other. So what would we expect if we've got a bunch of electrons grouped around a nucleus? What are those electrons going to do to other electrons? Repel them. They're going to push them away. Basically, those as soon as you start making covalent compounds or you start making covalent bonds, you wind up with the shapes of those orbitals changing. Those orbitals wind up mixing together in a way that that um, allows all of those different suborbitals to be pointed in different directions, which minimizes the amount of of uh, electronic repulsion. Right. This is. I'm not going to have you draw any of these. This is what's called the Feynman diagram. Who, who, who here has heard of Richard Feynman? I've mentioned him before. Uh, he's really good autobiography too. He's a really good writer. Um, won a Nobel Prize in Physics because he was the one who came up with the idea of, well, if we're not sure how we're going to represent this mathematically, I'm just going to draw a picture to show this. And so that's actually what this is showing is two electrons repelling each other. Uh, it's called a Feynman diagram. And he figured out a way to do this with lots of subatomic particles in a way that then you could take it and turn it around and turn it into the math that they were having, they were struggling with. He got around a mathematical issue by just drawing a picture on a napkin, um, literally on a napkin. He used to go to a bar at lunch and not drink, but just hang out with the dancers there. Um, and like, like, and he literally started drawing these on cocktail napkins to try and explain to the dancers what his research was in. And he won a Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> um, really interesting guy. Also famously played the bongo drums in Carnival in uh, in Rio as like a guest of honor at one point. He played the bongo drums apparently really well. All right. So if we've got these electrons repelling each other, but they're all stuck around that central nucleus, then the way that we can minimize those repulsions, we don't really rank it as like, how far away these electrons are from each other in a distance. We do it in terms of angles because all of these electrons are still stuck around that central atom, right? But what naturally happens when you start making these covalent bonds is you get groups of electrons, which kind of makes sense when we're talking about these bonds in our drawings, right? We kind of, these, these atoms and these electrons have to take up space in the physical realm. And they're naturally going to arrange themselves so that they're as far away from each other as possible because electrons have what kind of a charge? Negative. All right, so when we only have, if we have three things in a row, if we we're talking about Let's say we're talking about carbon dioxide. Does anybody remember what the Lewis dot structure for carbon dioxide looked like? It's like the first example where we had to do double bonds. Yeah. We had carbon in the middle, oxygen on either side, 
the oxygens each had two lone pairs. This molecule naturally aligns itself so that there's about 180 degrees between these two bonds. There's only two things taking up space around the carbon, right? There's a total of eight electrons. There's a total of four bonds here. But this double bond here has to be in the same general vicinity. Right, so there's really only two things taking up space. Two, we call electron domains, or uh, electron clouds. And so, if you have two electron domains, the furthest apart they could get is 180 degrees. Macy, so whenever you have electrons, they, have they will always. Be they won't be entirely symmetrical as soon as we get into more complicated molecules, but they'll be close. So like a carbon-hydrogen bond doesn't take up as much space as a carbon-oxygen bond because the oxygen is bigger. But you're on the right track. They're going to naturally arrange themselves to have as much space as possible. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a good analogy. You're mad at your best friend, but you're stuck sitting next to them on a bus while you go to your athletic event. Where do you look? Opposite directions, right? You're stuck sitting next to each other, but you don't want to look at each other. You look in opposite directions. That's kind of like what the electrons are doing. It's a bad analogy. That was the best I could come up with on the fly. When we have three electron domains, how much space do they have? Two electron domains could be 180 degrees from each other. It would make sense that we get, well, 240 in one direction gives us what the other direction? Oh, wait, no. We have 360 broken up into three segments, 120 degrees each. Don't worry, this is this is not quite the most complicated the geometry gets, but we're close. Especially since I'm not going to make you actually do the derivation for what happens in three dimensions. But these two types of geometries, we just have a, a name that we use to classify these. The same way that we use square to mean a certain polygon, right? That has four sides that are all the same length. And what is it, uh, four interior angles of 90 degrees and everything has to be parallel. Those criteria are what make up a square, right? We have, we have similar names for these geometries. If you have three points and the middle point is, uh, there's 180 degrees here, how would we describe these three points? in terms of uh, like plotting them on an algebra plot. I'll just thought it doesn't really matter. It's linear. We call this linear. This is, we've got it still, it's broken up into three sections instead of two now. It's not linear. We call this one trigonal planar. The words are a mouthful but they are fairly descriptive once you get the hang of what the vocab is. Um, and also, I'm not going to test you specifically on the names. If you can draw it and show me the, the approximately the correct angles and have them labeled. If I said, what's the geometry of BF3? Either one of these, either writing trigonal planar or drawing it out like this and say 120 degrees, those are both valid full credit answers. So if you really dislike the idea of being forced to memorize these random seeming names that are that are uh, obnoxiously complicated, and you just draw. You just have to give me something to show that you're, it's, you understand what the angles are supposed to be. 
What if we have four electron groups? What's the furthest apart they could get? It would be 90 if we were talking about on a flat surface. As soon as we get in, and that's, that's kind of a trick question. I didn't mean to, I should stop asking it that way. As soon as we get three dimensions involved, things get more complicated. Because if we had three dimensions, let's, we'll use uh, methane as an example here. If we're drawing this on a flat surface, we'd say the first part that you get is 90 degrees. But really what happens if we take this and we put it in three dimensions, we get a different shape. We get a tetrahedral shape. So a tetrahedral shape basically means that we took these four electron groups and instead of spreading them out to 90 degrees, picture taking one of these hydrogens and pulling it out of the plane of the board. So it's pointing straight towards us. And the other three will naturally sort of arrange themselves pointed away from it. And so the, the way that we usually draw these, since chemists are famously not artists, um, the way that we draw this is so that we don't rely on being able to use perspective and shading or anything like that. Um, so we have a couple of key shortcuts. If I'm trying to show the three-dimensional space for something with four electron groups, we use a series of wedges and dashes. The wedges representing a bond coming out of the board towards you. And then if you do kind of like the same wedge shape, but as dotted lines, that's representing going behind the board. So when you do that, now all of a sudden, if you use a little bit of imagination, the wedges and dashes help. Kind of, it's, it's a really crude way to show the perspective, but if you know what it's trying to convey, you can use your imagination and kind of see what that's showing you, right? It's showing you this. Right, and so this shape, if you want to visualize the same shape, anybody play um, <coughs> Dungeons and Dragons ever? Any games like that? This is a D4. It's a four-sided die. It's a three-sided pyramid. They call it a tetrahedron because the fourth side is the side that it sits on. Right, and so a, a four-sided die is a tetrahedron, is the name of that polyhedron. So we call this a tetrahedral geometry. So we had linear, we had trigonal planar, and now we have tetrahedral. So we can go one more, right? Because we have some elements that can break the octet rule. As long as we're dealing only with the second row of the periodic table, we never have to go past tetrahedral geometry because nothing from the second row of the periodic table will ever have more than four bonds. However, when we start getting past that, we start seeing larger shapes, not larger, more complex shapes. The other, the next one, I'll leave trigonal planar up there. If you have five electron groups, see uh, phosphorus pentafluoride is an example. If you have five electron groups, you basically get a trigonal planar geometry, except that then your fourth one sticks straight out of the board towards you, and your fifth one is straight into the board away from you. So it's kind of like a triangle, except with with one thing sticking up and one thing sticking down, which I can draw using those wedges and dashes. So this is a trigonal planar shape that I turned on its side so that the flat part is into the board and out of the board. So basically, it's still that triangular shape. We just added two more things on top of it. 
So we still use that word trigonal. Trigonal means three. It's not trigonal planar anymore. What does planar mean? On a single plane or flat. This isn't flat, flat anymore. So when we're naming this one, we call it trigonal bipyramidal. The long word. Bi means two. Pyramidal means pyramids. So basically, you have a pyramid out of the top pieces here, and then a pyramid out of the bottom pieces. All right, this one's actually the trickiest one. These two are the trickiest ones to wrap your head around. We're gonna add one more, but the one more is actually a simpler one to visualize for our brains because it works in 90, de 90 degrees. If you have six things attached to a central atom, six things attached to a central atom, the furthest apart they can all get from each other, everything's 90 degrees from everything else. You basically make a square, and then you have one thing sticking up from the square and one thing sticking down from the square. So sulfur hexafluoride. <laughs> So if you picture this as being flat, sticking in, into the board and out of the board, where these are 90 degrees from each other, and then sit one more fluorine up, one more fluorine down. So back to, back to my board games players. This is an eight-sided die. Anybody know what the name is for a polyhedron with eight sides? Octahedron. Octahedron. Oh, oh my god. god. Well done. <laughs> it looks, it seems like it should be a, a cube, but it's more like you're putting a point in the middle of each face of a cube. Right? Which actually makes it makes a, a series of eight triangles all linked together. If you picture taking a regular cube and putting a, a uh, dot in the middle of each face and then connecting all of those dots, you get this shape, an octahedral shape. All right, this is as far as we go because basically once you get close, more than six things around a central atom, you run out of space. Electrons in these orbitals really don't like to be closer than 90 degrees to each other. So for the most part, you don't see anything going in geometry of past octahedral. All right, so what do we do with this? So here's better drawings. I almost use the same examples. Our five basic shapes, linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, an octahedral. So the wedges and the dashes aren't that bad as far as showing perspective, but obviously something like this makes it with the shading makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. So what do we do with this? Well, if you know your Lewis dot structures for, for a compound or a polyatomic ion, then you know how many electron domains you have taking up space around it. And if you know how many electron domains you have, they're always going to fit into one of these five geometries. Right? Until you get past six, six things in the same, um, around the same central atom. But like I said, that's really an extreme case. So, Let's go back to nitrate, because we used this one earlier. We drew it like this. What's the geometry going to be around the nitrogen?
Yeah, because those even though we've got a double bond here, they still count as one electron domain because they're in one space. So we naturally think in 90 degrees. That's the way that our brains work. That's the way most of the structures are built. That's the way that your taper is lined. But that's not the best way to actually draw this one. The best way to draw this would be your nitrogens and your oxygens all about 120 degrees from each other. So the nitrogen, we'd say, is trigonal planar. All right, so these are just, just basically ways to categorize the shapes, right? So again, I know their names are obnoxious, um, and they're kind of hard to visualize, but it, everything's always going to fit into one of these five shapes. And as long as we can make the Lewis dot structure for our compounds, we can always figure out which of these shapes it is. All right, last last topic here. So here's a more complete view. The five shapes we already talked about are this first column here. Basically, when you have lone pairs, when you have pairs of electrons taking up space, it makes things look more complicated because we can't see the electrons. The way we can actually measure where these atoms are relies on us bouncing x-rays off of them, off of the nuclei. Lone pairs don't have nuclei, right? Those electrons that are just present as a, as a non-bonding pair of electrons. And so they don't show up when we do this x-ray crystallography. So we can't measure where they are, but we can still see the effects because we can see these angles, basically see empty spaces. And so that's what they call the molecular geometry. The electron geometry is always going to be one of these first, these first uh, columns here. Linear, trigonal, planar, tetrahedral, trigonal, bipyramidal, and octahedral. What we call the molecular geometry is basically like, okay, now get rid of any electrons that aren't part of the bond because we can't see them. They're still taking up space, but if we had, say, a tetrahedral shape, uh, we use nitrogen. If we had NH3, ammonia, when we do the Lewis dot structure for ammonia, we'd find that we have four groups of electrons taking up space. Four groups of electrons taking up space, four electron domains means what's the, the electron geometry? Which of those first four or first five shapes? Four things taking up space means the electron geometry is tetrahedral. Because we might not be able to see the lone pair, but we can see that it's pushing on the other, on the other atoms. So for this molecule, we'd say that the electron geometry is tetrahedral. And then the molecular geometry is basically take whatever you just drew and erase the lone pairs. If you can't see the lone pairs, it looks like it's a little bit of a different shape, right? You can still kind of see the tetrahedral part of it, but if we can't see that lone pair, it looks like it's something different. That's what the rest of these boxes are. So, okay, well, our electron geometry is tetrahedral, but we can't see one of those things. So we give it a new name. We call it trigonal pyramidal. So the molecular geometry for this one is trigonal pyramidal or trigonal pyramid. All right, so that's what the, and these are the ones where, like these first 
fives that we've looked at, linear trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramid, and octahedral. Those are those are probably worth memorizing. You're going to use them all the time when we're doing these geometries. The rest of these also, also have names. Those are the ones that, if you don't want to remember that it's called a seesaw, if you could draw it with approximately the right angles, I would accept that as a full credit answer. All right, so like sulfur, sulfur tetrafluoride. Sulfur tetrafluoride's Lewis dot structure winds up looking like looking like this. That's five groups of electrons taking up space around the sulfur. So it's electron geometry, be trigonal by pyramid. If you can't see one of those things though, they will arrange themselves. And I'm gonna reposition it so that it looks a little bit easier or it's a little easier for me to draw. Uh, we'll put this one. You can see why this one might get called a, sea, a uh, seesaw, because if you picture this as being the part of the seesaw that you sit on, and these two fluorines being the supports in the middle, it kind of looks like a seesaw a little bit, right? Or a sawhorse. Um, so some of these are not, let's see. It takes a little bit of imagination on some of these to see how the names relate. And again, that's why I'm not going to be super picky on the names for these as long as you can draw it looking like that. All right, so this is gonna be another 10% another of, your, of your midterm. Is can you just can you do not all at once though? So or like it's gonna be draw the Lewis dot structure and then tell me about the geometries. All right, so it won't be fully this, but it's gonna build because you got to make a Lewis dot structure first, and then you can figure out what the electron geometry is, and then you can figure out what the molecular geometry is. All right, so more practice on that incoming. For now, uh, that was a pretty good lecture. We'll call that for now. Be done a few minutes early. So you can ask questions about the nomenclature if you have any, or if you want to do more practice with these, just let me know.